Hey everyone, welcome to this week's workshop. So, apologies for being late. First off, I got stuck in traffic and there we go. So, I posted yesterday 17 strategies that Dr. Amy Baker um, found in the majority of alienation cases. Now, not all are present, but the level of severity will indicate sort of how many are present. So today I want to talk about how do you tackle them again. This is all from, um, I will wave to those of you that are watching. Um, again, this is from the work of Amy Baker and I'm going to go through each of the strategies and then what they found as being the best way to tackle it. First off, I want to say that these are based on the fact that you have left contact with your children still. Obviously, for those of you that don't, this is harder because the the alienation is in full force and it's hard harder to um, bring these. Hi, Andrew. It's harder to bring these um, bring the children back in and you do any t uh, practical strategies with them when you're just not having contact. There are still things that you can do from an emotional level, but in terms of practical strategies, this is based on you having some level of contact with your children. So I'm going to get straight on with it. Um, obviously, ask any questions um, as we go along. They, like I say, they are from Amy Baker and um, a gentleman called Fine. I can't remember his full name. Let me have a quick look. Um, Paul Fine. Okay, so first one is the bad mouthing. Now, obviously, bad mouthing is um, a very common tactic used by narcissists um, to undermine you and to ensure that they maintain their hero or victim um, status within the situation. So after separation, after divorce, you will get the blame for everything. Um, and then they will do that with the children. So they will they will say to the children, the reason that you've separated is because um, of of you. You are to blame for that. You're the reason they can't you can't be a family. Um, any if they can't go on a school trip, even if it's because they refuse to pay or they didn't tell you about it, you will get the blame. If you're late, even though you turned up at the time you were given, but they set you up. You are to blame, you get bad mouth. So, and then what happens is the children can then start to do that. Still, children can start to replay this narrative, parrot this narrative to you. So, what um, Amy Baker um, identifies as being one of the strategies is to say something along the lines of, I see you're really hurt, angry, or upset. I'm really sorry that you're feeling that way. Actually, there's some things that are going on between us that are making me feel hurt or angry or upset. Also, how about if we go out for um, coffee and try and hash this out so we can get along better? Now, that's to the alienated parent, the alienating parent, sorry. Now, that's not going to be possible for some of you. I totally accept that. But what one of the first things that you can do in front of the child, that's what's important, is you can tackle this in front of the child. So you can show the child that you are trying to find solutions, that you also have those feelings and you are trying to be proactive. This sends a very powerful message to the child that maybe you're not the problem. Maybe you aren't the bad person. So that's the first thing you do. The second one is to show empathy. Um, so go through what their list of complaints are. So for example, mummy says that you don't love us anymore or dad told me the reason he left is that you had an affair. The important thing is for you to remain calm. Obviously that's not nice to hear that your child knows something they shouldn't, especially very young children, they shouldn't be brought into those situations. And the natural reaction can be, it's wrong that you were told that. You absolutely should not know that. But you need to stay calm because you've got to show your child that you are empath empathetic to their feelings. That 
you know, that would be really hurtful them for them to think that you've chosen someone else over them. And if that's where they where they're at, you've got to meet them now. And this is this is what Amy Baker is saying. So she her response is, I wonder if that was upsetting for you to hear. Can you tell me what it was like for you when they said that? So you're not addressing the proving or not proving that that is true. What you're doing is you're meeting the child where they are at. You are showing them that you understand. Again, this carefully unpicks the narrative that you are this big bad wolf and that you don't care about them. When your actions, which we know actions speak louder than words, your actions are showing something very, very different. So if the accusation is about you not loving your child, you can say, I want you to know that I love you very much. You're my special son or daughter and I cherish our relationship. And I don't want you to think for one moment that I don't love or care for you. So you can then ex invite your child to explain if they feel that you perhaps have been um, loving or unloving and not as loving or available as you could have been. So it may have been hard for you that I moved out of the house. That maybe makes you feel that I'm divorcing you rather than just divorcing your mum or your dad. So again, what you're showing is that you have an understanding that it, it will be difficult for them. And if they've been told that it's because of them, you need to show them. I understand how hard that would be. The... The thing that most parents do is they want to give their side of the story. They want to say, no, of course that's not true. The reason we're separating is because mummy and daddy don't get along anymore and, um, or, you know, even worse than that. When actually what your child is looking for is reassurance. Reassurance that it isn't about them. Reassurance that you still love them. Um, and so it's offering that to them. So that if the accusation is related to adult situations, you've got to use your judgment about how much you share. But it's always safe. This, I'm reading this direct. Always safe to say something like, you know, I have my own side to this. At some point, maybe we can talk about this. But for now, what you need to know is that mummy and daddy could not get along well enough to stay married. And we're going to live in two homes but we both love you and we'll be taking care of you. And you could even add, sometimes it's easier to think that something is all one person's fault, but that it really is not the case. So again, you're not apportioning blame in any of that. You are reassuring your child. You are offering them that reassurance that they need, that you still love them and that it's not about them. Uh, so... To help them develop critical thinking skills, which is something the narcissist doesn't want them to have. The narcissist wants them to go along with everything they say. They don't want them to think for themselves. They want to have complete control over their child's mind. So in order to encourage them, you could say something like, you might hear some bad things about me, but it's important that you decide for yourself what you believe. And I think that's really powerful for all children in these situations is encouraging them and asking them, is that what you believe? Is that what you feel? Because that is what is going to challenge that narrative. That is what is going to make them think, oh, actually, what time I spend with you is always fun and you always show me love and I do feel very loved with you. And it won't match what's being told. And it's, again, developing those skills that the narcissist isn't going to want from their children. So... Strategy number two was limiting contact. Again, common tactic, they will limit it by, as I've said, dropping them off late, picking them up early. Um, illness is used, obviously COVID has been this amazing free gift for many narcissists to, to, to shut down contact, um, either by their own choice, by saying that they're, they're self-isolated and they can't see them, so there'll be some, some that are doing that, but Often in alienation, what it's about is them saying to you, oh, they can't come because you live next door to people and those people might have it. So it's not safe for them to come to you, even though that they are also living next door to people. So they will just twist the rules and, and, and use it for that. So uh, 
the response is a three-pronged response. So firstly, you let you know, you let you, the child know either next time or if you've got text contact. I thought we were going to get together today, last week, whenever, but you couldn't come. So it's just reinforcing that you were available. You wanted that contact. You're not portioning blame. You're not saying, but mummy or daddy stopped it. Or even that the child, you're just saying, but you couldn't come. So it's fact, it's not, no, no blame in that whatsoever. Second, obviously, document this. Document it and speak to your legal counsel if you have, if that if you are contemplating, or even if you're not at the, this moment in time thinking about court, document it anyway. Keep a diary. I I posted a while ago. The best weapon you've got in this is your diary because you need to record what you were doing. So when accusations are made, you can say, well, actually, on that day, I was working out of town or something i didn't even see them that day because you stopped contact but equally when they are having this pattern of behavior where they're stopping you need to be able to evidence it third if there's one particular trouble spot so like i say you know it might be um they could arrive too early um or they uh drop them off late it's thinking about how you can get creative around that so um, Amy uses the example of um, if the parent arrives early to collect them and is very adamant that they're here, so don't make them wait. And obviously the children get anxious if they know the alienating parent is outside, then they feel very anxious and they feel they've got to go uh, because they can't possibly be enjoying time with you. So she gives the examples of you could disable the doorbell and um, or go out um or you could be playing in the back garden so that you can't hear it obviously for some things it's going to be harder to be creative but it's just another another strategy for you to try and overcome it so the third one is interfering with communication now this might be as it's quite common when they're on your with you you're you're enjoying time with them they constantly text or try and ring or you know, even I've known people buy puppies or and kittens so that they can send them pictures. And it, it just creates that anxiety in the child that they think they're missing out on something that looks really fun. Um, and so it's all unfair, but it's all designed to interrupt your time. So probably try um, begin by letting your child know that. Oh, the other one, obviously, is if blocking contact. So if they when they're with them, you you not being allowed to speak to them, you um, not being able to text them, ring them as agreed. Um, so let your child know, did you get the card I sent you? I tried to call you last night, uh, but you couldn't come to the phone. So you, again, you are just reaffirming that you are available. You are making the effort. And again, no blame apportioned with that whatsoever. So if your child's with you and it's being interfered with, um you can um <laughs> you can <laughs> you can uh send things to um to for the child when they're with you you can send something so they arrive when they're with the alienating parent um so <laughs> So a targeted parent could let the child know that a special surprise was slipped into the envelope to maintain the child's excitement and interest. In this way, the child will know that the items were mailed and should be keen to receive them. So, sorry, I, I probably didn't explain that very well because it was making me giggle. So when they're with you, you go with, with your child, you put something together. Um, obviously have some time by yourself. Put something together and take it to the post office with them. So they know that they will receive it when they're with the alienating parent. Build up that surprise with, oh, I put something in the card or in the envelope so that the child knows to expect it. And then you don't, obviously you don't tell them. So you can say this way, you know that I'm telling the truth. Oh no, sorry, we don't say that. So it's not about apportioning that blame. It is about you wanting to show your child that you are sending stuff. And then if the child doesn't receive it because the 
I, the alienated parent won't know that you've done that together. So if they don't receive it, then it's that it's just that seed that has been planted with the child will think, why didn't I get that? Because I know it was sent. So what is happening? It just starts to unpick. It's that narrative. Um, so again, you can use other other tactics, emails, social media, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not about controlling. It is about actually act, uh, communicating them with you when you have something to say. You know, the reality is it's not going to be a normal co-parenting relationship where, you know, if a child's feeling a bit poorly and they say, oh, I really just, can I just phone my mum or can I just phone my dad? I'm not feeling very well. And the other parent goes, yeah, of course you can. And you pick up the phone. Oh, darling, I'm sorry you feel so poorly. I'm sure mummy or daddy's taking good care of you. You know, brilliant. Wouldn't that be amazing if your kids had that? They haven't. So the co communication that you have is not normal and it's not natural. And so it's thinking of ways that you are showing your children that you are always trying, that you are always available to them. Even when you're, they're being told that you're not, you're kind of just planting those seeds that you are available so strategy four is interfering with symbolic communication. So symbolic communication is things like photos around the house, teddy bears that you used to give, that, that they used to have and that were your door, even clothes that you buy them not being allowed in the house. I know clothing is a massive issue between, between households. But those kind of things are essentially what they're saying to the child is that person doesn't exist and cannot be spoken about. That parent does not exist in this house and I will not allow them to be spoken about do not talk about them do not look at them do not think about them you know they 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 as far as I'm concerned in this house they do not exist so they will get rid of everything associated with you so in terms of like for example not having any photographs first step would be to give the other parent a picture of you in front of the child and ask him or her mum or dad to let the child have it in their room. This puts the alienating parent in a difficult position whereby they have to then either to say in front of the child, no, that's not happening, which again, will start raising those questions. Um, but it shows that you are willing, you want this, you want them to have it, but also you can say, I, is there a photo you would like to have that I can have or that the child can have in their room. So you're showing that it's you're willing to have a photo of them for your child in their room for them, if it comforts them. And if they don't, again, it's just highlighting that contrast. Another response might be to have some pictures taken of you and your child together. And obviously the child is likely to be very proud of them and want to show them off, especially if you get them done professionally or in a really amazing place, you know, those ones at Alton Towers, probably not open at the moment, but where you're on the rise, they're always great ones because they're a really good memento of the day and something you've done together. They're going to want them. So you can send them, you can give them copies of those that they're going to want to keep. You know, you can get the key rings, you can get mugs, you can send them via their phone. Just you want to keep giving them opportunities to have things in their house that belong that belong to not belong to you but are symbolic of you and your relationship strategy four is withdrawal of love and again this is very common that alienating parents will just not allow anything positive to be said about you in their presence and as part of the alienation process, that is how they draw out the rejection. That's how they start with the alienation is that initially they elicit a criticism and then that criticism gets embellished to the point where they convince the child that you are unsafe. Um, and so the first part of that is that withdrawal of love. What, what you will feel as the parent is the withdrawal, the child feeling very uncomfortable in expressing their love for you. That may start off at handovers with them sort of being a bit standoffish towards you. As soon as they get in the car, they're their normal selves. It could start in the house where they're a bit uncomfortable with giving you a cuddle because they've had this rhetoric 
drummed into them but they they will eventually relax into it but if not there's some things that you can say such as you seem awfully worried about disappointing mum or dad you don't need to add to that you don't need to ask any more at that point you can just see what the response is you could also say is it hard for you when mum or dad is disappointed or angry with you how about when I'm angry or disappointed with you? Again, we're looking at bringing into the consciousness of the child that this difference between how you treat them and how their other parent treats them. You're showing them that it's not normal for them to have to caretake the emotions of their parent. You seem more worried about not having mum or dad mad at you than you seem about not having me mad at you. So they're, they're okay with you being mad at them, but... They don't want their other mum and dad. Again, it's just, you're not drawing any conclusions. You're not giving them the answer. You're merely just starting a conversation with them so that they can start to recognise these things. So next strategy is telling the child the target parent does not love him or her. It's probably one of the most awful things a parent could ever do, really, is to say to their child that their parent doesn't love them. I mean, it's it's so destroying for a child because it's half of them, the one person on the planet who sort of has to love them and their other parent who, again, is supposed to love them is saying, oh, they don't love you. They don't love you. They love their new family. That kind of thing is so hurtful for a child. So it just it just creates this real feeling of lack of worthiness unlovability in a child and which leads to long-term mental health problems so you need to be you need to be able to really demonstrate love in a in a in an unconditional way um so lots of displays of affection not over the top just genuine displays of affection you know as we said actions speak louder than words so a cuddle um even just a smile can feel very loving but you've got to be in tune with that yourself you know it's difficult if you haven't experienced love yourself it can be really hard to express it in a in a way that feels that is received as love so just be very aware of how you to what if you've ever looked at love languages i recommend having a, just a quick look at what your love language is your child's might be slightly different but be aware when you want to communicate love talk their language okay so google love languages it's mainly meant for for romantic relations but it's also how different people receive love and your child will have their their own way of knowing when they are loved and you you know as a empath empathic uh, parent you should know what is the way that your child best receives love and so make sure you are speaking their language so something you can say is sometimes when parents divorce children may come to believe that one of their parents does not love them anymore you may wonder about whether i love you and i want you to know that i do and that i always will what do you think we can do to make sure that you know that I love you? Again, that's about un helping you to understand what your child needs and what their language is around love. So forcing a child to choose, otherwise known as a loyalty conflict. So this can be incredibly difficult for a, um, a targeted parent to experience because you never want your child to be in this position. A child, no child, to, child should ever be made to choose between their parents. They should be free to love, as we all should. We should all be free to love whoever we choose, but particularly children should be free to love both parents. And putting them into a loyalty conflict is incredibly harmful. And that can be very frustrating. So, you know... <sighs> It's perfectly possible that, you know, they do, we see this all the time with alienating parents, that it might, it, I'm trying to think of a working example. They might ask the question, would you like to go to your dad's today or would you like to come to the cinema with me and all your brothers and sisters? 
It's not really a choice, is it? It's a loyalty conflict because what they're saying is you can go and have a really boring time with that parent or you can come and have great fun. If you don't come and have great fun, you're missing out. So it's that that kind of thing where the chi the the apple or the cap carrot, that's the right one, the carrot is so sparkly and delicious that it it forces the child to make that choice. Even when they love that parent it's like you will choose me because i've got this amazing thing and you know what that speaks to the mentality of the narcissist who are so insecure that they know they have to buy affection but they will also do it in controlling ways with the language that they use um making sort of insinuations that the other parent isn't safe or that they don't love them you know all those things will place them into that conflict so something that you could perhaps say if this is happening is, I'm sorry that we couldn't be together last week. I was really looking forward to us being together. I had some special things planned, but then you called and said that you decided not to come. I felt disappointed that we could not be together, and I'm wondering how that was for you. I know sometimes it must be hard to leave one home and go to the other. You might be involved in an activity and really be in the swing of things, or maybe you worry that you're missing out on something special going on there if you spend too much time with me. How can I help you with that? So again, it's recognising that child is caught in that conflict, that you're not portioning blame. What you're saying is you understand that it can be difficult. What can you do to help them? It all adds to that narrative that you are the understanding, the loving, the safe parent in this okay so i'm going to do one more and then i think i might do the other half next week because i am i don't know if you can see but my face is starting to melt and i need to get some fresh air <laughs> and a drink um so i'm going to do one more strategy and then i will cover the rest next week because obviously there is quite a lot um, and there's a lot for you to take in so final one i'm going to cover today is creating the impression that the targeted parent is dangerous so I've kind of been insinuating that already. So again, what I've talked about is they start to elicit a elicit a complaint from the child. So they would do that by saying, "Oh, did you have a nice time at mum or dad's?" And when they say, when the child says, "Yeah, yeah, it was great. We did this," the narcissist or the innating parent will be all, "Oh, all right then." And the child who's been conditioned to be the emotional regulator for this parent will go oh my god they're upset how can i make this right oh well actually it wasn't that great this happened oh oh tell me more tell me more they get their attention they they get the reinforcement that they need and they can then expand on that and criticism will come out they they told me off for you know you know you're a parent you are gonna have to tell your kids off at some point but as soon as that is blurted out the targeted parent will leap on that and say, oh my God, they're so abusive. They're so controlling. They were just like that with me, faking empathy. And so the child then learns, okay, when I'm critical of you, the targeted parent, I get the response and the attention that I desperately want from this parent. And it that's how they align. Like I say, they create that false empathy with they feel the same. I've been the victim too. And it, it sort of encourages that alignment. Obviously, as a targeted parent, that's horrendous because you know you love your child. You would never do anything to hurt them. And your child is suddenly starting to think that they or make out that you are in some way scary or dangerous. So if you've heard something said that it's important that from the from the targeted parent, it's important that you um, correct this straight away, but not in an aggressive or hostile manner. So remember, assertive, grey rock. So an example of how you could word it is, hi, whoever, I just heard you tell my child that I, in whatever, whatever they do, whatever they've said, insinuated you do, you know, I really remember that pretty differently than you do. I remember, and then the truth of the event, we both did our share of silly things in our youth. Remember when we, give an example of something that you both did, I'm glad we are both more careful and responsible now. 
So to the child, what you want to be saying is, I wonder what that felt like to hear or to think that I had done whatever you were accused of doing. Well, I just want you to know that that is not exactly what happened and that I would never do anything like that now that I am a mum or dad and have you in my life. So that's kind of working on the premise that it was something that happened in the past before the child was born. But it could be about anything. It's about saying it must have been really hard for you to hear that someone you love and that you feel safe around could do something like that. I want you to know that I would never ever do anything like that because I am your mummy or daddy and I hope that you know that, you know. So it, again, it's not blame. It's not saying your mum or your dad is lying. It, what it's saying is, I'm so sorry that you were put in that position. I'm so sorry how you might have felt at hearing that. And again, just reaffirming that it's not the truth but you don't have to fully explain the circumstances you are just saying that's not what happened okay so that's eight of the 17 that we have covered today i will do the remaining nine next week just because like i say i am just sweltering and i really need a drink so i hope you found that really useful um i say all based on the work by amy baker who been doing this work for decades she really does she works with these are from adult alienated children the work that she does with adult alienated children so this is her having those conversations and saying to them what did you need to hear obviously pulling in all about psychology child development attachment as well but this is actually based on her work with adult children who have been alienated so it really is very true and very powerful. Um, so obviously I've I've given you a lot of information and I suggest you probably re-watching with a pen and pad and making a note of some of them. Um, but yeah, I hope you have found that helpful. Next week I will cover the remaining nine. Take care everyone. Bye.